Sure. Well, I was, I was, uh, I was about to take you uh, to a point in time where I was stood in on national TV with my business unraveling in front of me. And uh, if, if anyone's familiar with Dragon's Den or Shark's Tank, as they call it in the US, uh, I was stood in front of five dragons having one of my trunkies manhandled uh, and uh, one of the parts broke in front of the, the, the live TV cameras and my, my business was called worthless. Uh, none of the dragons thought it was investable and uh, I really wish I'd invented a time machine and not a ride on suitcase. <laughs> Uh, but let me take you a little bit further back in time when uh, I had this dream of revolution in children's travel. So back in 1997, I was studying product design at university. And as a second year design student, we were all asked to enter a national luggage design competition. And it was there. Uh, I drifted off into a, a local department store to try and find what was fashionable at the time in, in adult luggage. And uh, I, I distinctly remember hard molded suitcases were quite fashionable. You may remember them, the likes of Carlton uh, were making these big black boring massive pieces of plastic. Uh, but I couldn't really find much inspiration there. And it was maybe the inner child in me, but I drifted off into the children's trial toy section and it was there looking at rotate looking at ride on toys which are manufactured using a, a technique called rotational molding which wastes a lot of space you may remember or reminisce about your little ride on tractor as i was doing and thinking well there was no storage space in those toys you could lift up the saddle and there was enough space for an apple or something so why not make a really functional ride on toy that uses the adult manufacturing technology of injection molding and make it fun and functional and ergonomic for kids to ride so I thought I'd come up with quite a unique uh, cool idea and, and my confidence was both bolstered a bit further when I went on to win this competition. Here's a picture of me at the ripe old age of 19 wearing my first ever suit accepting this award from the judges uh, and the reason I've got this picture here is it's, it's quite got quite a bit of posterity to me because it, it was the judges who took me aside and said you know what Rob you've got quite a commercial idea here you should try and license it I thought wow that sounds like a great idea maybe I could find a manufacturer to sell them all over the world they'll pay me some nice big royalty checks and I'll be able to retire and sip cocktails on the beach uh, or maybe drink some gin and tonic while being on pit cube uh, and uh, <laughs> I thought brilliant so uh, I approached uh, Colton back then the luggage manufacturer really excited showed them my prototype that I'd handcrafted out of insulation foam and my presentation boards that uh, really explained how Trunky was going to revolutionize children's travel only to be told fairly quickly in that meeting that Carlton were in the business of making luggage and I had invented a piece of uh, toy product so they very politely turned me down and I kind of left that meeting empty-handed I then uh, went and approached uh, toy companies who then very politely told me I'd invented a piece of luggage and not a toy. Uh, so none of the major manufacturers wanted to pick this revolutionizing concept up. So I graduated and worked in Taiwan and New York and some of London's leading design consultancies over the interim years and eventually found a startup toy company in 2003 who were absolutely bowled over by the concept and bit my arm off to license Trunky. So I was really excited. Their first customer was a Saudi Arabian brand uh, who had rebranded Barbie Fula because Barbie doesn't sell too well in the Middle East, doesn't have the same cultural values, I guess. Uh, so they ran this TV ad, Fula right on the, the Fula Trunky Travel Case, they called it. And uh, I was really excited. I was going to be able to retire young and drink those cocktails um, and over the next three years this toy company with their global <laughs> licensing deal managed to sell all over the world well actually they didn't they only had this one customer in Saudi Arabia deeply disappointed he had never been to the UK or the US or even Europe and um, in October 2005 I took a phone call from them saying that they were having to go into voluntary liquidation and they weren't able to represent Trunky anymore Within a matter of minutes, I kind of breathed a sigh of relief that um, I can hopefully take control back of this product and try and launch it myself. The simple observation I took from that, that three-year licensing period was they were simply trying to market Trunky as a cheap ride-on toy amongst much cheaper ride-on toys, when really that Trunky was a, a lifestyle brand to be pitched at mum to enable her to travel with her kids a lot easier. 
Um, so simply taking the brand back and having a stab at remarketing the product as a lifestyle brand, uh, I felt might have some wheels and I may be able to get some success. No sooner had I been trading for a couple of months than uh, the height of the terrorist threats you may remember back in 2006, uh, I think it was a, an incident at Glasgow Air where the government decided to ban hand luggage. I had just launched my children's hand luggage business and my product was banned. <laughs> So quite a, quite a big challenge there, force majeure you may call it. Back then it was just me working in my bedroom with no employees, so I didn't have a payroll to meet. Um, but kind of sitting back thinking, I don't know how long this band's going to go on for. I really have put all my marketing eggs in one basket and really promoted Trunky for air travel. How can I try and uh, pivot the marketing model and try and convince people to use my product for other holiday occasions? The uh, solution was quite simple. Uh, we gave birth to Frida the Frisian cow print trunkie and uh, marketed her for domestic travel, staycations and camping. Uh, fortunately that luggage ban only was in effect of uh, I think about six weeks so didn't have to ride that storm for too long but no sooner had the ban been lifted that episode of Dragon's Den aired. So, so um, yeah, I thought I really wanted to get some um, brand exposure and what a great idea of taking Trunky on the TV to do that. But also I had no money and I had no real business knowledge. My my kind of financial acumen was I, I took it, taken out a £10,000 personal loan to buy that first container of Trunkies. And I thought, well, if it takes me a year to sell them, at least I'd have made my money back, knowing nothing about having to buy replenishment stock for the ones you've sold. Uh, so... Yeah, I could have really done with some really valuable business mentoring. Uh, but no sooner my I went on the den asking for £100,000 for 10% of my business. And the pitch went perfectly. Richard Farley, the Australian in season three, uh, was really interested. I towed him around the studio. And not, not shortly longer, shortly after that, Trixie, our pink trunky, ended up at the bottom of uh, uh, a guy called Theo Pathetis' feet, and he's quite famous for strength testing products. And he started to grab and pull various parts of the trunky, and uh, when he got hold of the toe strap, he managed to rip it off. And at that point, all the dragons jumped on the, the uh, quality of the product and uh, branded my company completely worthless. So I had six months before this episode was going to air, and I kind of thought, um, uh, I started trading internationally. I started winning um, accounts in America and Germany and uh, Japan, and we were, we were winning a few awards. But the day came nearer and nearer that this episode was going to air, and I thought, this is going to completely ruin my business. Um, the, the week before the episode aired, the Radio Times, the local TV listing magazine, advertised the episode as wheelie rubbish. Now, I kind of had hoped the BBC would have uh, at least polished the episode a little bit to, to give me some sort of credibility. But uh, having read the, the listing for that, for that evening, I thought, this is it. Um, my business is going to be ruined. I might get some web traffic, but no one's going to want to buy a trunky. That's it, game over. So I thought, well, I might as well use the opportunity to try and get some feedback from customers. I put a bit of vulnerability out there and I posted a survey up on the website just asking for people to answer a few questions and then the last question, um, please leave any other comments. And the night the program aired, I had over 2,000 people fill out that survey with phenomenal words of support. They, the public saw through the theatrical edit and they absolutely loved the concept of Trunky. I actually sold a shed load that night too and it was a real kind of turning point uh, and kind of really believing in the product and trying to get a direct dialogue going with the end user, the consumer, uh, really paid dividends. Now, you can imagine if the none of the major luggage and toy manufacturers wanted to take Trunky, I was struggling to get into the shops too. So I was literally just selling on my website and a few small independent retailers around the Bristol area where I'm from. Uh, but after Dragon's Den aired, a young junior 
luggage buyer John Lewis um, decided to take a, a meeting with me. I've been passed around the toy buyer, the luggage buyer, the baby buyer. No one wanted to take my meeting. But after the Dragon's Den aired, we sat down, we talked commercials, and he agreed to list the Trunky in all 26 of their national stores. And for the next three years, we could not keep up the demand. So a real kind of t turning point for the business uh, and kind of quite a few challenges I had to overcome. So really, I think the question uh, there is kind of to, to, to you guys, what kind of things do you think I was able to do to keep myself going through these hard times? And, uh, and also a question about what are your big challenges? So we have Hans, Simon Cooper, Loris, if you want to join one of those tables. Okay, great. Well, I, I, yeah, I think some of the rewards of sticking at it uh, and being able to weather a lot of that resilience uh, has resulted us in us selling over three and a half million suitcases now around the world. The product's on sale in over 100 countries, and uh, we've won quite a few awards for the product too over those years. But the most important thing is having a fantastic team, and very early on in my journey I realized I might have a great product but to take it to the next level I needed a great team and how I was going to get that team on board. I've tried lots of things over the years but I'm, I'm just going to talk about two two main themes that really work for me and resonate uh, uh, really well. I think one of the first things is is having a really clear vision or a why, why you're in business. And for us, it's we don't make children's plastic luggage. We make products that allow parents and parents to take their children off exploring the world, learning about new cultures and tasting new foods. And, and really, we see our, our products as a, like a, a vehicle for education as well. So when, when you have a really clear vision or a why, why I think it's really important to, to nail that and then get your your team behind that vision and start communicating that to your customers and, and lots of people put these signs up in their offices about what their mission vision values are uh, but for us there's no better representation of what we stand for than our Instagram feed and just having these fantastic user generated product photos uh, from around the world of our kid of kids using our products experiencing all these new things uh, it is hugely rewarding for me personally but it's pretty much the best marketing assets we could get our hands on and they are free so we're, we're really always trying to now think how we can use these assets more across our marketing messages uh, across our website internally within the organization um, so I think there's some really interesting powerful tools out there now for for us it's Instagram that can allow you to really share what your vision is to a wider community. Uh, and it's quite interesting, we've got a very unique name, hashtag Trunky, and when you're searching Instagram it throws up some interesting pictures, some, some beautiful pictures of kids having birthday cakes made in the shape of a Trunky all the way through to, can you spot the odd, odd one out there? <laughs> Let me just see if I can uh, jump down with you guys and point to it if you haven't spotted it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, there you go, you got it. Yep, so uh, Trunky is a brand name that resonates the world over, apart from in Poland where it means being intoxicated. <laughs> so it does throw up some quite interesting uh, articles on Google Alerts and also on Instagram. But, uh, uh, So I think uh, the other learning I've had is about being really focused and uh, and our most popular request we get from customers is, uh, can you make a trunky for grown-ups? There's nothing more I would love than to make a giant trunky, but we have to be late focused on what we do and that's making revolutionary children's travel gear. Uh, so despite it being the most common request we get, we don't have those sales channels set up to get into the adult luggage market. Uh, and also, I'm not too sure how many people would actually pay £200 for a giant chunk trunky. Uh, but you've got to be laser focused and you've got to say no a lot. We could design a whole range of other products outside of our core competency of children's travel gear, but we have to say no. We have stay laser focused on what we know and what we can market and what we can uh, what we can create a, a real difference in the world around so it's about being really focused 
and that's allowed us to create um, uh, a really varied portfolio of children's travel gear. Let me just jump down with you guys again. So Trunky was our first product, and then we got some focus groups together, started asking consumers about what the next next greatest travel woe was. Uh, and when they started talking about traveling with car seats, there were lots of swear words used. So we kind of yes. knew there might be an opportunity to, uh, to develop and innovate in that category. So Booster Pack, that product there, uh, set in the middle of the top slide um, was a, a product we created that allows uh, children to carry their own booster cushion on their back it's fully certified for European car safety standards but it's hollow inside and allows them to pack goods inside a bit like the, the, the trunky observation booster seats at the time were made out of rotation molding which wasted a lot of space and we just use the injection molding technology to make a really hard durable shell but have the space underneath uh, to create um, to create a storage storage capacity for kids to carry around. We've also tried to stretch our brand into the tween area with Journey here on the far right, top right, which was a travel solution designed for eight to 12 year olds, allows them to easily access their technology uh, and sit in, on their, their Journey product and move through the queue. We decided to call it Journey because Trunky went in our market research uh, had a lot of association with younger children, so we created a new teenage brand for, for that product. And then when we started looking closer to home about, well, we want to get kids out and about more. We don't want to just have our products used for holiday. We want to create other things that enable parents and carers to get their kids out the front door. Uh, we discovered things like children's reins that you may have seen in the market hadn't actually been reinvented since the 70s. When you start talking to consumers about how, the, how they enjoy using them, they found them incredibly awkward and difficult to put on. Children hated wearing them, and it was a product that was ripe for some design thinking. So we created a, a, a really quick and easy adjustment uh, mechanism that we patented to allow the children to put this product on. It was bright and colorful. Um, the real challenge here came when you're competing against commoditized products, you're selling at a much higher premium. So you could buy one of these children's reins for five pounds in mother care, and our product was close to 20. So it's quite a challenging conversation to have with mother care at the time and some of the retailers about trying to put our product on the shelf. But they took the risk, they believed in our innovation and our proof that we could market revenue revolutionary products with, from Trunky uh, and they started selling and they started selling pretty well and Mother Care were absolutely delighted because they were making at least four times the cash margin per one product sale than these cheap um, commoditized products. So it's a real kind of lesson that if you really believe in creating a, a product that's going to add real value, you can charge a premium for it and you can revolutionize another market. And then we've created um, swimming bags that are uh, bright and colourful, but are fully waterproof uh, and a whole range of other products from uh, children's neck rests. This is another classic observation. When you're driving in a car, uh, a child's head's always slumped forward. So we created this neck rest that had um, ingenious little magnets that connect underneath the child's chin to, uh, to create a nice comfortable chin rest for the, the child to have a comfortable doze. So, um, We've pioneered this new category of children's travel, but again, it comes back to the retailers. They all have their segregated buying departments. So in John Lewis, the, the suitcase might sell in um, luggage and our car seat might sell in uh, the nursery department and our, our reins, or sorry, the swimming bags might sell in sport and outdoor, but no, a consumer can't come across our brand. And that was really important. We needed to um, create a simple mechanism that would allow uh, the retailer to want to list all our products together. And again, that came through, um, through another simple observation and thought or well, we've created trunkies in nine different colors uh, we have this kind of trunky rainbow color palette so let's just color coordinate our entire range so that each one of these new products uh, can can meet one of our nine trunky color palettes and it will really create a nice strong point of sale for in-store uh, theater and this has been really critical to, to getting uh, our products sold all over the world and creating very strong striking uh, retail space but when you're doing something differently it's it's always a challenge you're always going to face obstacles and you've always got to think creatively at, at solving them 
whether it be a, a product, a service, or just an idea, you're always going to meet resistance when you're trying to push something new forward. So you've got to be prepared to, it's going to take some time, but also be prepared to try and solve the problems that are thrown back at you when you're trying to launch such a thing. So my next question really to the, to the group was, uh, what's your focus within your organization? What's your, what are you trying to become the best in the world at? So A to H, three groups, I to P, and Q to Z. Okay, projects will never get completed. That ties in with mine. Disconnected activities, is that? Uh... Uh, too many diverse immediate priorities. There's always something pops up that has to be dealt with immediately. Uh, it takes you off to the side. Great. Well, I was I was going to carry on talking a bit more about um, values, but it sounds like we've got a, a time to wrap up. So I guess it's just it's really important to set down within your business what your goals are and be laser focused on achieving them. Um, but you've also got to be prepared to pivot and to adapt to the changing commercial landscapes or whatever the, the environment is that your, your, your business is in or what you're trading in. Um, so for me, I mean, I've got, I've got a couple of um, values here that I think uh, we, we've done that have worked really well for us in our organization. <clears throat> and this is, a, this is a tip, I guess, to everyone. We, again, we all talk about values and these kind of tools that we should use within our strategy. Uh, so for me, I think it's got to be really visual to everyone. Everyone in our organization has a plaque like this with four photos they've chosen, which represent each one of our our values. That's being uh, innovative, dynamic, responsible, and fun. So for me, being innovative isn't just about product development. It's about trying to uh, think differently across the organization and to encourage people to always question, is this the best way of doing things? Being dynamic is is having the confidence to to pivot from your business model uh, and to to trust people to uh, to try things and fail. Um, so an example of this is when we uh, we we had a, a business plan to launch in America and it changed ten times uh, over a period of six months. And that was uh, we could have gone down a rabbit warren and lost an awful lot of money, but because the team believed they could challenge and be dynamic about their their thinking and their strategy, we ended up in a, a really low cost, low risk solution to enter the U.S. market. Uh, being responsible isn't just about the environment and we create plastic products, but they have to last a very long time and be fully recyclable at the end of life. Uh, it's about being responsible to the people that you work with too. So everyone in our organization gets a thousand pound professional development pot to spend on developing their knowledge base and their skill base, whether they're their CFO or customer service representative. Everyone has access to that thousand pounds to, to professionally develop. And our final, our final value is about having fun. I mean, you spend so much of your time working. It's it's always good to take a step back, celebrate success, and, and have a bit of fun too. Uh, I think this slide here. Uh, let me see if I can just jump back one. Uh, is a great example of our. Um, uh, a great example of all our values. This is the working environment we created at the mothership in Bristol where we all work. Uh, and it's really funky, fun and informal. And it really embed embodies those values. So uh, we have a slide there as, as is quite trendy to have in offices now. Uh, but that's the that's the icon for fun. And it's always good fun to push the bank manager down there when he comes uh, uh, to <laughs> talk to us. Uh, and now I think it, in today's world where space travel is, is we're on the cusp of commercializing it. I think uh, we all have an opportunity to, to believe that Trunky could be used in uh, trips to the moon in the not too distant future. And that's one of my personal goals. <laughs> uh, but it's been great sharing some of my story with you. And um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully you've, you're going to leave feeling inspired. And uh, I'll let you get out there and enjoy the, the good sun now. Thank you very Rob. much, Rob. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rob. Oh, Thank, you. Thank you.
can all gather in circle. Can I ask, can I ask you a question? Thank you so much. Sure. 